So uh, today we are going to talk about, um, I'm going to finish up with proteins and uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the 20 amino acids and which of them are essential and which of them are uh, non-essential. Um, um, what does that even mean? So uh, non-essential amino acids are one, amino acids that uh, can be synthesized by the body. All right. Uh, your body can make any of uh, the non-essential amino acids, and you see them in that, that list there um, on the right-hand side. Uh, the non-essential amino acids, are, are there's 12 of them, um, or sometimes people say 10. Uh, these are amino acids that can be made from any other amino acid. Right, from any other nitrogen source in the body. Uh, so say you have a bunch of alanine, but you need some asparagine. Uh, you're going to make asparagine. Your body can convert alanine into asparagine. And there's like a host of biochemical pathways that your body uh, has to, to do this. Right, It's like pretty deep dive into some chemistry. Uh, that's a good question. Um, well... It, it can happen, I think, in any of the cells in your body. Yeah, I think it can happen in any of the cells in your body. That's a good question I've never had before. Uh, and it's not actually as trivial as it may sound because there are certain cells uh, that, so for example, um, only your liver can take up fructose, for example, when you eat fructose. Uh, fruit sugar, the only organ in your body that can utilize fructose is the liver, and that puts a real burden on the liver when you eat a lot of fructose. Um, but I, I believe any of the cells in your body that have new, uh, protein requirements, which is essentially all of them, can, uh, can do these conversions. Um, but there are eight amino acids that your body cannot do this to, and that the body requires to make the functional proteins that are you, uh, but those amino acids need to be derived from the diet. You got to get them uh, by eating them. And uh, you see them here outlined in red. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the, the eight of them there are uh, essential. Arginine and histidine are sometimes considered essential amino acids. Uh, because uh, some uh, adults and, and all children are not able to make uh, adequate amounts of these two amino acids. Uh, adults, and, and the reason for that is uh, children are in a positive nitrogen balance, so they have increased uh, requirement uh, for these amino acids compared to the volume of food that they're consuming. So what are all these numbers? Let's look at uh, some of these, these numbers. Um, you have to eat enough amino acids within the day in the form of a protein to provide the nitrogen required for your body to make uh, the uh, non-essential amino acids and the other uh, molecules that use nitrogen. So... Um, you can look at, this is a breakdown in by gender, year, uh, meaning age, and uh, body mass um, uh, for the uh, amount of protein that's required. So you can see here, for example, uh, in your age range, uh, you're like 19 to 24, a typical male uh, sitting in this classroom would need about 58 grams of protein a day, whereas a female, uh, on average, would require 46 uh, grams per day. Now, this is uh, with the caveat that this is an av a person with an average amount of physical activity. If you are an athlete that is putting on muscle mass, uh, if you are a bodybuilder that is adding muscle mass, not just a bodybuilder, but if you're trying to add muscle mass, you're going to need more protein than that in a day. 
if you are a woman that is pregnant, you have increased nitrogen demands. So uh, if you look there, uh, so for example, a 25 to 50 year old woman needs about 50 grams of protein per day. However, if you are uh, pregnant, you tack an extra 10 grams per day onto that. Uh, so a pregnant woman needs about 60 grams per day, and that's because, again, she's in positive nitrogen balance. Uh, and, in fact, a larger draw on protein for women is milk, uh, the production, lactation, the production of milk. So you can see that in the first six months of life, the child's should be exclusive source of protein is coming from mother's milk, and uh, that baby needs 15 grams of milk a day. Uh, or you can see, I guess, um, in the chart, the, the baby needs 13 grams, it says, uh, per day. I guess there's a couple grams that, ne that are needed for the, the mother's machinery to uh, produce all that. So that 13 grams a day in the first line of this table gets uh, represented uh, in, the, in the mother's diet, right? She has to eat that 13 grams a day uh, for that, that baby. Yeah? Um, what happens if you, like, overeat proteins? Mm. Do you consume too much? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, so what, what happens is you reach what's called uh, renal threshold. So uh, your kidneys are responsible for filtering the blood and all uh, water-soluble nutrients um, get filtered out of the blood into uh, what's, it's not quite urine yet, we call it tubular fluid because it's in the tubes of the, of the kidneys. Um, and then the body resorbs what it, what it can, right? There's like proteins there, they're going to pull back the glucose that gets filtered out of the blood because you don't want to just like pee all your nutrients away. And the same with amino acids. Each of the amino acids, um, there's a certain, uh, what's called transport maximum. It, it's really the proteins, there's a certain number of proteins that are being expressed in the tubes in the kidneys. And you can imagine them just being like a turnstile at a subway. And if you've been at a subway, not during rush hour, then people are just going through the turnstiles. Uh, and, and there's, you know, no one has to wait in line. But if there's like a huge crush of people during uh, rush hour, that would be like eating a big meal of protein. Uh, there's a lot of protein in that tubular fluid that's been filtered out of the blood. It's trying to get sucked back into the blood by these turnstile machines. Um, and those turnstiles can only accommodate so many at one time. And if that, uh, if you have exceeded the transport capacity of those proteins to resorb all that, uh, those amino acids, then the amino, you just pee them out. And it's actually quite common uh, to find uh, amino acids in the urine of a lot of people, like bodybuilders, they drink all this whey protein. Often those guys are in what's called amino acid urea, meaning their, uh, their amino acid content of their urine is like really elevated because they've consumed too much uh, protein. If you do that, if you're in chronic amino acid urea because, I don't know, you're just eating a huge ton of protein all the time, uh, it can lead to some problems with your kidneys uh, in, in over the long term. But yeah, it's not, it's not probably... So it doesn't come at all, it just kind of... Nope. Nope. Your body in general, yeah, I'll get to you. Your body in general does not store water-soluble things. Water-soluble vitamins. Water, so like there's a famous story about Linus Pauling who was like this, uh, you know, nu nuclear physicist or whatever. Um, and, but he, after getting the Nobel Prize for all his nuclear physics work, he got really interested in vitamin C and he, as an antioxidant, uh, citric acid. And he thought it was like the cure to cancer and all this stuff because they were just learning about uh, cancer and whatever. And so he would take these mega, mega, mega doses of vitamin C. And many of you have probably seen those like vitamin C packs, like emergency or whatever. There's a million of them. You pour that stuff, you drink it, it's great. You're getting some vitamin C. Your body probably needs some. But like the, the you know, whatever it is, you know, how many ever milligrams of, of vitamin C are in those packs, they're huge. Um, I mean, like a thousand milligrams, you are entirely peeing that out. That is 
that is leaving your body um, in your urine. So water soluble stuff does not get stored in the body uh, in general. I, there, I'd have to think if there was an exception to that. I don't know. But um, lipid soluble stuff does get stored in the body. So like vitamin A and vitamin D, your body does uh, store that stuff. Uh, vitamin E gets stored in the body. That's a lipid soluble uh, vitamin. Because it doesn't pass out in the urine, your body doesn't have like a ready way of, uh, of unloading it. It can metabolize that stuff if it needs to, but you had a question a while ago. Well, it's certainly sufficient. I mean, honestly, you know, for a person your age, 46 grams per day is not hard to get here in America. Um, yeah, so... You know, if you look at a at a at a protein bar, like one of those you know protein bars they have out there, uh, like a little snack bar, that that probably has 25 grams of protein in it right there. This is more than half of what you actually need in a day. If your body's not growing a lot, uh, you don't really need a, whole, a ton of protein. So, does protein is protein powder an excellent way to get protein? I would say no because you probably don't need that much protein. Um, you're just paying a bunch of money for this like expensive isolated protein that you're going to eat and then it's going to pass out of, in your urine anyways. Uh, this, is to, this is for like the you know, general populace. Are there examples where protein powder or other protein supplements like protein shakes and all that stuff are warranted? Of course there are. Uh, of course there are. So yeah, I mean... That you know, this you start talking about nitrogen balance uh, issues. Then you know, are you in positive nitrogen balance? Well, yeah, you got to be aware of your your you know protein requirements at that point. Uh, or do you have some kind of wasting disease where you're like shedding nitrogen? And you know, yes, that that person is going to need uh, nitrogen supplements. But um, in general, I mean, if you are vegetarian even, uh, but you're eating a little bit of like a, a serving of protein a day, you're probably getting plenty of protein that way, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, I'm not against them. It's just like a, a lot of money for, for something you don't, I don't think you really need unless you're doing something special. Yeah, what's up? Um, I was just wondering what you need more than you So uh, you're looking at past the age of 25. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I mean, by the time you get to 25 or so, uh, you're, you, you may not think it, but you're still, right now, you, your body is still gaining mass, right? Uh, you know, maybe not a whole lot, but you, you know, the, the like distribution of muscle uh, and lipid and fat stores on your body, if you break your body apart into those three categories, is, is still changing into your early uh, 20s. And uh, you, you sort of reach that, that protein carrying capacity max by the time you get out of college here. And you compare a photo of you know, most incoming freshmen to most outgoing seniors, and you can see a noticeable change in the like size of their bodies or the muscle mass, you know, they, they become more adult looking. When you reach that adult state, uh, there is like a higher baseline uh, requirement for maintenance of protein in the body. Does that make sense? Any other questions? So good. You guys are asking questions today. I love it. I'm not going to finish my, all my slides, but that's okay. Uh, okay. So that was all the uh, non-essential amino acids, uh, but you also have to have a minimum amount of the essential amino acids. So not only do, is there like a bulk protein requirement of nitrogen to make all the non-essential ones, you, you have to have all the essential amino acids. Does this mean you have to have all of these every day? Of course not. Uh, the, I don't know what to say the time window that you're averaging across is, uh, but, you know, if you don't get enough histidine in a day, you know, did you get enough histidine in the week? Did you get enough histidine in the month? Are you, like, are you deficient in something? Um, so you can see here uh, these numbers are 
um, quite high in infants. So this unit that I'm looking at is milligrams per kilogram of body mass. So what is the the body mass and how and for each kilogram of body mass, how many milligrams is that? kilogram of body require per day. So it's milligrams per kilogram body mass per day um, by age group. Is that warping anyone's brain? You got, you got that? Okay, good. Um, and you can see infants, and this is all World Health Organization numbers, uh, old numbers that were established back in the 80s. Um, infants have a very high requirement for a lot of these essential amino acids. Uh, they are really building <laughs> protein rapidly. Not all of those, uh, not all of those amino acids have the same requirements. Uh, so, for example, you need a lot more phenylalanine than you need tryptophan. Why might that be? There's a couple reasons. Take a wild guess. What do you think? What are we doing with these amino acids? Creating other ones? Well, probably not going to create a whole lot of other ones out of these amino acids. You, I, you may be able to, and I don't know all the biochemical pathways for those transitions, uh, but that's not, yeah, making non-essential amino acids out of essential amino acids is not the main uh, reason we need essential amino acids. Do you think you're, so we said there were 20 amino acids. Is your, does that mean uh, that your body is 5% glycine, 5% uh, alanine, 5% methionine, 5% histidine? Is that what that means? No, it doesn't mean that. No. Uh, it, your body is, requires different amounts of each of these amino acids, right? Because the proteins that make up your body have different amounts of the amino acids in them, okay? So it turns out that phenylalanine is a really important amino acid for your body, and you need a pretty high uh, amount, mass amount of that. The other thing that's kind of throwing these numbers a little is that uh, not all amino acids are created the same. We know that. Uh, so, for example, glycine um, was the simplest of the amino acids that I showed you, <coughs> right? Um, it just had a, a, a hydrogen for a side group. Whereas phenylalanine has got this giant aromatic ring uh, with the phenolic group sticking off it, a molecule of phenylalanine weighs more than a molecule of alanine. Uh, all right, so you sort of get more amino acid for mass when you're, when you're looking at a smaller amino acid than, than a larger one. That's the other reason for that. Um, and then as you become an adult, your requirement, and, and again, this is for uh, adults that aren't in some kind of like positive nitrogen balance or something like that, but uh, your requirements for amino acids drop dramatically. Um, so a complete protein is, is defined as a protein that has all of the essential amino acids uh, in the reasonably correct proportions for humans. So in general, pretty much all animal products, I, I want you to know before I embark on this next section here, that I am not, um, I'm just going to try to provide you with some facts. I'm not cheerleading for meat, and I'm not cheerleading for vegetarianism or veganism, any of that. I'm not going to take a stand. Like, I have my choices that I make. I don't call myself anything uh, besides maybe an omnivore, a uh, conscious omnivore who tries to be aware of what I eat. But um, I'm going to give you the facts. I'm going to try to at least. So uh, animal products do in fact uh, have all of the essential amino acids that your body requires um, and typically in the correct proportions. This should not be a surprise. We are animals those other animals also have those requirements for essential amino acids. They're getting them. The, it's like working its way up the food chain. We eat those animals. We get what we need. Uh, so not a shocker there. 
Um, and then there are a lot of other proteins and plant-based proteins for those of you who want to tread more lightly on the earth. Um, so for example, quinoa, uh, hemp seed. Has anyone ever eaten hemp seed? It's delicious, uh, nutty. Who's had quinoa before? Maybe most of you. It's on the, it's on the dining hall uh, salad bar. Uh, amaranth is another grain quite similar to quinoa, a delicious grain. It's that red stuff over on the right-hand side. Uh, soybeans are also a complete protein, which is why uh, tofu is a pretty common, uh, or edamame, as you see there, just like the whole soybean, uh, are pr pretty common uh, foods. Uh, buckwheat, has anyone ever had buckwheat before? Probably buckwheat pancakes, some of you may have had. These are big and Maine, like ploys. Anyone used ploys mix before? Uh, chia, also on the salad bar uh, in some of the dining halls at least, is a complete protein. Uh, peas, complete proteins. Um, and so then most plant foods are actually incomplete proteins. So for example, rice uh, is missing lysine. And um, so, you know, um, for example, uh, one of the ways, if you get, if, if you are prone to cold sores, uh, one of the thoughts is that uh, it is exacerbated by lysine deficiency. So uh, you can go and take lysine tablets, pump your lysine up, and help with that result. Yeah, what? So what do they do, like, back when they couldn't just go to the Whole Foods and get food, or get, get food that has lysine? Back, you know, what are these cultures that like, eat only rice, or? Well, you know, so for example, uh, cultures that don't eat only rice, uh, there's not a lot of cultures that eat only oh, rice, but, um, you know, a lot of Eastern cultures consume a lot of rice. In fact, a lot of the world does, but in, in the East, soy is also a large uh, commodity over there, and I've already told you that that's a complete protein. So, uh, but excellent question, because that le it's going to lead me into my next point, which is, uh, complementary proteins. So the idea is a lot of, if you look at a lot of the cuisine around the world, particularly cuisine that is uh, vegetarian, um, you find that the components of that, uh, of that cuisine have complementary proteins in them. So for example, um, in Latin American cultures, uh, you often see beans paired with rice. And uh, rice doesn't have very much uh, lysine, and beans lack methionine. But you put them together, and the two of them form a complete protein. Uh, likewise, uh, wheat and hummus form a complete uh, protein. So, um, you know, pita bread and hummus is a very common uh, meal in the, in the Mediterranean, in the Middle East. Um, so it's this idea of food combining uh, that um, is, is important. You know, all of this, they didn't understand essential amino acids like 3,000 or 6,000. I don't know when they first started making pita bread a long time ago. Unleavened bread is like, you know, they talk about that in the Bible way back in the Torah. Um, but they just, you know, they found foods that paired well together that led to a healthy outcome. It's sort of like trial and error. And that's how, uh, you know, the great cuisines of the world uh, evolved. They came up with food that tasted well, paired well uh, together, but then also led to the kind of health outcomes that uh, let those people thrive. Uh, all right. So um, it wasn't until uh, much later that this idea of food combining uh, gained a lot of traction. And uh, one of the people that was the earliest advocates of this concept was this woman here. She is really, she makes me, it makes me like get goosebumps and tear up when I think about her. Frances Mortal Pay is uh, one of my heroes. Um, and I remember being younger even than you guys. Uh, I was about 17 when I read this book, Here, Diet for a Small Planet. Has anyone heard of this book before? No one? 
Uh, well, it's, it's worth finding a tattered copy at the Goodwill or something. Uh, it's a pretty interesting book. But it grew out of her um, dissertation, her, her uh, studies in, in college. And um, in that book, she, uh, you know, started, ex you know, exploring the essential amino acids, what foods had each of these amino acids, and started doing a little bit of ethnography behind this. And she came up with, uh, this is just a page out, at chart 10, uh, summary of complementary protein relationships. Uh, and she started coming up with the concept of food combining. One of her central thesis was she was the first person to really uh, shine a, a, a spotlight for popular culture on the notion that uh, meat production was, and the, and the level of consumption seen in the United States scaled up to a global scale, was unsustainable. That the planet could not sustain the level of meat consumption that uh, the United States was doing in 1971 uh, on, the, on a global scale. Um, and so she advocated a much more vegetable-based diet um, and uh, talked about it in this book. She's a real uh, interesting person. And you see her here with her, uh, her two children, um, this idea that she had uh, got picked up, the book was actually a bestseller in, in 71, it got picked up in um, Vogue magazine on the cover of Vogue in 1975, it suddenly became Vogue, quote, the secret of meatless eating so you feel better, spend less money. Um, and that sort of got the idea popularized to like the American household, uh, the American housewife. And then uh, following that lead, a few months later, um, the American Journal of Nursing uh, then began to publish this Making Vegetarian Diets Nutritious, and this idea of food uh, combining gained traction in the medical community, and is when it really uh, began uh, to be widely understood. So their diets can be adequate palatable and appealing to, you, to the eye, but vegetarians need considerable information to choose foods that provide the essential amino acids, B12 and other nutrients. Well, yeah, that's, yeah, yes, that's right. Um, you do need to know that you need a, a varied supply of, of proteins. You need to have like a rich, not monochromatic diet, um, but you don't really need to know much more beyond that in, in the modern uh, age of vegetarianism. So, um, Here's just a quote from her. 71, I stress protein complementarity because I assumed that the only way to get enough protein was to create a protein as usable by the body as animal protein. In, com in combating the myth that meat is the only way to get high-quality protein, I reinforced another myth. I gave the impression that in order to get enough protein without meat, considerable care was needed in choosing foods. Actually, it's much easier than I thought. Uh, with three important exceptions, there are very little danger of protein deficiency in a plant food diet. Uh, the exceptions are diets very heavily dependent on fruit, uh, some tubers such as sweet potatoes or junk food. Uh, so she's saying, and this is the point that I was making just before I came to this slide, that unless you have a very monochromatic diet, like you're only eating fruit, there are fruititarians out there, um, and, or if you live in some really remote place and you're only eating sweet potatoes or cassava and there are places in the world that are like that, um, uh, or if you eat junk food. And certainly there are vegetarians who have super crap diets uh, that eat nothing but junk food. Um, so uh, otherwise, you're going to get all the essential amino acids. And this idea of food complementarity doesn't have a whole lot of meaning in the modern, uh, in the context of the modern diet and food availability uh, within a place like the United States at, at least. Um, so, I'm, I'm so starstruck by this lady just because I got to meet her. I got to meet one of my heroes. Oh, it was such a, a fun thing for me. That's uh, her right in the middle and my shaggy uh, self hanging out beside her. I got to meet her. Not only did I meet her, but I made a meal. I cooked a meal for everyone in this photograph uh, for her based in, the, in February 
entirely on locally sourced foods, which was quite a challenge for me, but it was really fun. Um, she uh, gave a talk. She was uh, she was the what was that the title of? Yeah, well, she was the environmental studies lecture series uh, speaker back in whatever year that was. But her talk is archived at uh, uh, at Colby. If you want to watch it, here's the link. All right, so we got a few minutes left here. Um, I've been we've been talking about veg vegetable versus meat sources of protein. Uh, what do you think? How much uh, does animal agriculture and eating meat uh, contribute to to global warming, to global climate change? Right. So that's one of the the one of the considerations when you think about the amount. This is kind of what Francis Moore Lupe was getting at. What uh, you know the the production of meat she claimed was uh, was too much of a burden on the, on the earth in terms of the production of greenhouse gases. Um, what, what do you think? What, overall, what does animal agriculture and eating meat, uh, what, what component of the greenhouse gas emission do you guys think uh, that is? Give me some numbers. Take a stab. 25. Okay. Um, I would say about 45. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Any other? So we have 10, 25, and 45. It's a, it's a pretty good range. Uh, actually, it's, it's only actually 13% uh, of direct. Um, so uh, this is impacts uh, in the production of uh, greenhouse gases from, from animals. Uh, it's, yeah, it's responsible for 13 to 18% of human-caused greenhouse gas emissions globally. Uh, it's actually much less in the United States, about 6% in the U.S. And where does this come from? It become, so this is all, uh, this is all um, farm gate, so like up to the gate of the farm, not beyond, not logistics, not transport. Uh, that kind of thing, because that transport is in its own separate category. This is just in the production on the farm. How much are the farms on Earth uh, contributing to the greenhouse gas emissions? Well, uh, of that 13%, about 35% is from uh, ruminant fermentation. What's a ruminant? What is a ruminant? A ruminant is like uh, What does it mean to ruminate on something? Hmm? That's right. It means to ponder. Yeah, I see some ruminating going on. Uh, a ruminant, does that mean animals that like to think deeply? No. No. To ruminate actually means uh, you've had a meal, you've got your glass of wine, you take a little sip of the port or whatever, and you sit and think and digest. You're digesting something. Maybe I've given you something to think about, and you're digesting it in your brain. To, to ruminate actually means to digest something. Uh, so a ruminant is an animal, you, typically a cow or a, a goat, something like that, that has like multiple stomachs, and they eat grass. And you can't just like eat grass and get it all out and, and go. Uh, you got to like, you know, if you ate a bunch of grass, you would know about it fairly quickly. Um, but uh, these cows, they eat it. And their body uh, ha it goes and sits in these stomachs for a long time. I wish I actually had the, the dwell time for grass. That's a number I should have. Uh, the dwell time for grass in the stomach of a ruminant. It just sits there and breaks down slowly until it gets turned from that woody pulp that it is uh, into the cow patty that comes out the back end. Um, yeah, so that's about 35% uh, ruminant enteric fermentation. What does that even mean? What does that mean? Ruminant enteric means their GI tract. Fermentation. What does fermentation? The fermenting stuff that we've done so far. What, uh, what's, what's been the agent of change in fermentation? What causes fermentation? Yeast the bacteria. That's right. Well, microbes. So we're talking about cows, GI tract, microbes are leading to greenhouse gas emissions. 
Huh? What does that actually mean? What is ruminant enteric fermentation a euphemism for here? Gas production. Cow farts. My, my nine-year-old would definitely uh, be willing to say cow farts, hopefully. <laughs> you guys aren't too shy. But yeah, cow farts. It's just like farts, right? Uh, cows actually fart a lot, and they emit a lot of uh, methane, yeah. Uh, ruminant wastes on pastures, uh, that's, that's like just cow patties sitting in the field. Uh, manure management, um, rice actually uh, releases a bunch of greenhouse gas. Uh, there is the energy that's required to produce all that stuff. Uh, and fertilization gives us a fair amount of greenhouse gas in the form of nitric, uh, uh, acid, uh, nitric oxide. Um, all right. So, yeah, these ruminant cattle produce methane in their farts and another compound called nitrous oxide. Um, these are, they're not produced in the same volume as CO2. So if you look here, this is, uh, on the left, this is the sector across all categories of greenhouse gas emissions. So like transportation, electricity production. Agriculture is just this little, uh, purple band down here. This is this is the U.S. Right. This is U.S. So U.S. is about six percent, not that thirteen, which would be much larger uh, for globally. Uh, but um, most of the greenhouse gas that's being emitted is carbon dioxide. But m these two down here, methane and nitrous oxide, although by uh, total they're smaller than carbon dioxide, methane uh, has a greenhouse a, a global warming potential that's uh, about 30 to 35 times higher than that of CO2. Nitrous oxide is almost 300 times the global warming potential of carbon dioxide. That means uh, if you look at the atmosphere after 100 years, you'll have 300 times more nitrous oxide still present in the atmosphere than carbon dioxide that had gotten released. All right, so it just dwells in the atmosphere a lot longer. Um, all right, so and, and so these the methane and the nitrous oxide are really important emissions from agricultural sources. Uh, I am going to stop lecturing there, and I'm going to have you guys for the last two minutes. Are there questions about any of those concepts? <laughs>